Welcome to the With Clarity and Purpose podcast with your host, Janet Borrego. Each week, I bring you an inspiring person or message to empower you to live life on your terms so you can be who you want to be, do what you are meant to do, and have the life you deserve to have. We will provide you with practical and cutting-edge approaches to continue getting clarity and direction on your path, mastering your mindset, and gaining confidence to tap into your inner wisdom so you can live on purpose. Welcome to another episode of With Clarity and Purpose. And today I am beyond excited because I have a very special and inspiring guest, Stephanie Garvey. I actually met Steph back in 2019. We were both doing our master neurolinguistic programming practitioner certifications. Sorry for the long wording. And Stephanie has this energy that really draws you into her and something that really impressed me from your journey, Stephanie, is how much you have overcome and how many obstacles you have overcome in order to build who you are today, to build this empowered self. So I can no way to dig deeper into your story. And recently we shared, we didn't share, but we were together three weeks in Hawaii mm -hmm. and we truly bonded over a common experience, which is we both had a miscarriage few months back. And I feel that allowed, allowed us to dig deeper within each, each one, each other's story. So I'm so happy to be here. Steph is an optimization coach. She loves helping people succeed and be more empowered by using different modalities. And we are going to talk about some of them. Neurolinguistic programming being one of them. Uh, and art, the healing arts, energy, and also plant medicine. So I love that last one. I haven't done it yet, but I'm curious. So we are going to talk about it too. <laughs> Welcome to the With Clarity on Purpose podcast. How are you doing, Steph? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Yes. Okay. So you have a really inspiring story, Steph, and I cannot wait until our audiences learn about it. Tell me more about yourself. Where were you born? And what happened during your childhood? Just tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was born in uh, Southern California, actually. Um, I grew up, though, in Portland, Oregon. So I was raised in a very religious home and it actually, they became, my parents became a lot more religious as time went on. So when I was very young, they weren't extraordinarily religious, but around age eight is when um, they started getting into some very interesting religious activities that ended up in us kind of being in um what most would consider a cult. So we ended up with a family of nine because they believed that you should have as many children as possible. It had to do with, um, having enough members of God's army or something like that. Yes. Um, so, so <laughs> just to paint the picture, yeah. I was homeschooled my, my entire childhood. Uh, my, my education was through homeschooling. And I didn't really have a lot of friends that were outside of the cult because um, it was looked down upon to, you know, to have people outside of that. Um, I don't know how in depth you want me to get along the way. Yeah. I mean, how, what do you think drove your parents to dig even deeper into that religious component mm. and end up in a cult, like mainly during that time? Yeah. So that's a great question. And as you and I both know, you know, everyone's doing the best they can with the resources yeah. that they have. My parents both came from really difficult childhoods. Um, my dad's dad committed suicide. Oh, um, his, his parents had a really painful divorce. My mom came from um, a very physically abusive family, 
And so I think when we come out of those difficult experiences, we're looking for something to fill us up. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we don't look at just finding that within ourselves. We look for things outside of us. And so I think that's really, they both got into the Jesus movement when they were in their early twenties. And so they were, I guess, lightly religious for several years. And then I think they were just trying to do the best they could. They were sold on this idea that they could, um, be like the best Christians out there. Yeah. Um, because their, their label was Christianity and, you know, don't come at me. I know that there's good Christians out there and everything, but that was the label that they had. And they were just sold on this idea that they could bypass the lessons in life if they followed these teachings. And so I think it was actually out of a, you know, a self-improvement and also out of a desire to actually see their kids do better in life than them. I think it was really out of love that they chose that path, but it ended up being extraordinarily destructive in many of their children's lives. I love that. And you're right. I mean, everyone has good intentions. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter what the behavior might be. And so I love that you give that perspective that they were trying to do better. And that's why they made those decisions. So how was your childhood? I didn't know you had so many siblings. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm the third, I'm the first daughter. My younger siblings are, uh, the next one is five years younger than me. And so I was definitely a caretaker for a lot of children. I can see that. (laughs) (laughs) Been a mom my whole life. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, in a lot of ways it was, it was fun because we had a lot of us to, um, I I think my family had a very magnetic pull to people in, in our group. And so we were always like the fun family, um, behind the scenes was a little bit of a different story because there was a lot of physical and sexual abuse that I experienced from a very young age all through my childhood. And so it was, um, it was kind of both. It was, it was a really rough childhood with a lot of big T traumas. And it was also a really fun childhood where we, you know, we didn't have the confines of a regular school schedule and, you know, we could go and have adventures and everything. So it was kind of both and. Wow. That's so interesting. It's that duality. Um, I mean, we are going to get into the lessons, right? After we dig a little bit deeper, but when do you start? questioning really like this cult and the environment that you were in how did that happen okay well at 19 I got married um it was one of those situations where women weren't supposed to get a higher education they weren't supposed to work outside the home their their goal was really only to be a helper to a man and so um I ended up my, my parents really liked this guy (laughs) and he liked me and I wanted out of the house. And so, um, I ended up getting married to a really amazing man. We're still friends. We're still co-parents and, uh, got married at 19, had a honeymoon baby right away. And a second one, right, right after that. And he was, he decided to go to college And so he was at a university and, you know, I'm in the throes of parenting and just trying to be the, the good girl, you know, the, the perfect creating the perfect idea, because I had really gotten sucked into that. If I was going to be a part of this, then I needed to be the best. And so I was in that and he started questioning things. And so he, he would come home and he'd, he'd be, you know, learning philosophy or something. And he'd be like, you know, this doesn't make any sense. This part of it where they, you know, the guy who was leading our, our cult, our church, uh, he, he had this idea that we were the only ones in history who had been given this truth. And, and, uh, so my husband at the time, would say things like, how is it that in all of history, that just this little tiny group of people of like 150 people in a little tiny town outside of Portland, Oregon would have the only truth of the entire world. It doesn't make any sense. So he would start bringing logic in and I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. I would, I 
would push back so hard because looking back on it now, it was because I knew that if I took that first little Jenga block out, everything was going to fall and I'd have to deal with it all. And I, and I just couldn't, I wasn't in the place to do that. So this went on for the, the whole three years that he was in school and we had made a pact that if he did his four years and three years that we would somehow find the money to study abroad for his last semester. So we packed up our two little kids. We had a one-year-old and two-year-old. Oh my God. (laughs) And we went and lived in Austria for um, his last semester. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. It was a great experience. It was my first time out of the country. Um, my first time really away from my family. So I had a lot of, a lot of interesting experiences there because he was in class a lot of the time. And so I'm in this foreign country without people that speak English with two babies. (laughs) You're a fun, my friend. (laughs) So I ended up of course I was still playing the good girl. So I found a church that spoke English. Wow. That I could go to. And I went and I noticed because in, I was in Salzburg and they have the music festivals there. So they bring in a lot of people, a lot of talent from all over the entire world. So there's all these different people from all over the world. And we circled up at the end of the service and held hands and, and there was a song that was playing and they were giving out, um, you know, sacrament to whoever wanted to partake. And I looked around and I thought, you know what? This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense that these people don't have the truth. And I would say that I did (laughs) when we're all here from all parts of the country or all all over the world. And then I was, I mean, anytime you travel internationally for the first time, especially if you're an American, like it's, it's a big deal to go outside of what you also think is like the best and see that people are actually thriving in all areas of the world and they just have different ways of doing it. And it's totally fine. And no matter how you say a word, it still is the same. Communicate. Yeah. Body language, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, that was my, that being in Salzburg, Austria was my first awakening and it allowed me, I think also because I had space away from the friends I had grown up with, my family, the cult that I was in, it was my, it gave me enough space to explore that even internally, even without saying it out loud. Wow. That's so powerful. So just tuning out all of the inputs, because even though I feel if our listeners haven't go, gone through a cult, we live in this hypnosis all the time. A hundred percent. Right. Of getting validated by everyone else. And we barely tune out and just tune into ourselves, even if it's the hard truth, the one that we need to listen at. Absolutely. So it just blows my mind that you took that chance and you took the chance to believe and start questioning your Mm -hmm. programming. The one that you had received during your whole childhood, that's such an experience. That's such a powerful lesson right there. Yes. So you went to Austria, you're like, okay. And really who planted the seed was your husband, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and then yep. the egg started cracking. The, the egg more started cracking. Yeah. And I will say, you know, we all live within confines of our mind, right? Yes. Regardless totally. of what you've experienced, we all have that. So when you start cracking at that, yes, it starts falling apart really fast. Totally. It has and to so fall apart. it yes. got worse before it got better because when I came home, I Um, we did some traveling for work for his work after that. So we continued to not really leave the cult, but not be a part of it because we were in different locations for six months to a year. And in that time, my PTSD went out of control. I mean, I had anxiety and panic and because I, because I had started to question these things, it really, um, I think that my my mind was fighting the safety because I, I had, I had created this false sense of security in playing this role within the confines. And so when I came back, we realized that we could not be a part of that anymore. 
And I think we were, uh, so we had been gone for two years and we came back, we tried to go back into it and we're, uh, it took mm, a couple months and we were like, we can't do this. And so it was a, a very big deal for our families because they were leadership in the cult and, uh, did not go over well at all, but we started going to a different church and I found a, they were doing a group trauma therapy, um, wow. for women. Awesome. And so I, I decided to go and it was a year long program. And so I found a therapist and I found that at the same time. And wow. it was the, it was my first experience of being heard and having space held for me. And it was so beautiful. And I, I, I talk very fondly about my, my first experience with talk therapy, because for some of us, we need to have the space to even speak totally. the unspeakable. Totally. And so for me, it was really powerful. I ended up being in a group in the group therapy. It was led by a, a therapist as well. Although that wasn't really, you know, technically why she was there. She was just a leader in, in the church, but, um, serendipitously she was there <laughs> and <laughs> out of the three other women, we all had completely different stories. Really? We were all working through completely different things. So it was really cool because it was, it was a way that we could, we had workbooks so we could work through things on our own during the week and then come together and share our experiences. And it, for me, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone because even though my experience is very different in the, in the story of it, in the facts of it, we're all having the same human experience of we working through it. Are. And it was so powerful yeah. to me to be vulnerable and, um, and to not feel alone. That was the first time that I didn't feel alone. And I had never told anyone about my sexual abuse. So, um, even my husband at the time didn't know about my sexual abuse. So that is so important. Yeah. So the first time asking for help and really being yeah. transparent and vulnerable. And the first time just, you know, getting that experience and knowing that you're not alone. Yeah. That's amazing. So let's go back to the PTSD. When did you start experiencing the PTSD? Was that when you started doubting or were you experiencing it even before then? I was experiencing it before, but it was, I feel like it was manageable. I had had panic attacks in my teenage years. Yeah. Um, and I'd had, I'd had very disordered sleep, uh, ever since I was a child because my sexual abuse started when I was, um, I think around seven years old. Wow. And so my, my sleep yeah. was, was always disturbed, um, ever since then. And so I would say that there were parts of it that had shown up, but I could still manage it. Um, not in an empowered way, but just in a shutting it down and, and burying it kind of a way. So it wasn't until I started doubting and opening myself up to other possibilities where it, I think it was really just my body's response of not knowing how to feel safe with me exploring these new thoughts and also a way to show me that it really wasn't okay. What, yeah. what I had experienced. And so it was trying to help me. I can see that now it was trying to help me to fix it because if it gets louder, you have to fix it. Yeah. It's so, I mean, I appreciate you so much for being vulnerable in this interview and just for sharing, because a few years back, I realized that sexual abuse in males and females was a lot more common than what I ever thought. I mm -hmm. mean, so many people. So I think you sharing your story is also inspiring others to realize that, I mean, you're not doomed or anything that happens no. to you. You can actually go through an empowerment journey that will let you realize that it wasn't you, you know, that happened to you. And there is a lesson to be learned there too. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Yeah. So, okay, the PTSD, all of that started. You moved back after two years. Mm -hmm. How was the conversation with your family? I mean, I've met 
people that they still don't talk to their families. They have gone through a similar scenario. How how was all of that communication yeah. and the relationship even now? I mean, yeah. So at that point, it was challenging. The conversations yeah. were very challenging. We went through, um, my family is a lot less aggressive in their communication. So they like to put rugs over the dirt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in that way, it was, it was easier to be around them, even though there was more to deal with on my side of the family, mm -hmm. it was easier to just pretend and do my own work while just pretending with them with, um, my husband at the time, his family, it was a lot more in, in, in our faces or in their faces, however you want to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> whatever perspective we were in each other's faces. <laughs> so, um, and it was interesting too, because it, it was an outcropping, not, it didn't, um, of course it got projected onto other things. Yeah. It got projected onto, we had a family business with them. It got projected onto my children, their grandchildren. So a lot of our disagreements and explosions happened about things that didn't have to do with the cult, but it was just a, almost a safer projection. There were things that mm -hmm. were happening in the business or with the kids that, um, you know, there, it became a severe break in our relationship with them. Yeah. That's and then funny. we ended up moving away again. And, um, it was more to get away from all of them mm -hmm. to get away from the friends that we grew up with. Um, and to get away from mostly to get away from our families because we didn't feel like we could really grow in the same environment that had kept us from growing. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking for all these opportunities to move away. And, um, this is, you know, this was right around the 2008 time and the fallout after. So jobs were a little bit scarce. So it was trying to find a good job, find to, you know, trying to find a place to move to. And so we ended up moving my then husband got a, a job at Zappos in Las Vegas. So we ended up moving to Las Vegas nice. and, um, while we were there was really when I decided to, um, talk with my family and confront them. And, uh, it had come down to, I had, I had done enough work at that point. It had been a, a couple of a year and a half or something working with a therapist. I did the year of the group therapy and I felt like I can't grow anymore until I set this boundary. And until I speak my truth, because there was part of that that was for me, but part of that was also for family members who I found out were still experiencing sexual abuse. Wow. And so for me, when I found that out, it was just this glaring, like you have to face this. You have to face this. You're the one, you're the only one that's willing to see it and, and say it. And okay. so I did, um, I confronted my parents and it did not go well, which I kind of expected. Um, I confronted some of the abusers and that did not go well either. And I, I did it in a way where I was very open with them about forgiving them for what had happened. And, uh, just that I wanted to shift the experience that was occurring in our family for those who are still experiencing things. And so <clears throat> It didn't go well. And then we just got pushed out of everything. So it was a, it was an easier way because we weren't really part of the cult. We'd already mm -hmm. kind of left it, even though we'd kept some of the friendships and everything. Um, we were still in good graces, you know, there was tension, but it was still like good graces that was all over. So we lost, um, we lost all of our friends that we had grown up with our, um, you know, my then husband, his, his mom reached out to say that we were dead to her. Um, when, when they found out that I was calling out my family, um, uh, my family would not deal with it. And so it was kind of a mutual, like, okay, then we can't be around you. And they're like, okay, we don't want you to be around us kind of a thing. So, um, 
that was, how old was I? I think I was 27. 27. It was that before we met? Yes. That was yes. before we met. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh. you know, if anybody's into astrology, that's right around, you know, your Saturn return is coming around that's and you got to right. face some shit. <laughs> you just learned that. <laughs> so, um, it was, a, you know, I went from being even in a very nerdy culty group. I was, I, I had a lot of friends. I was pretty popular, like very liked all of a sudden down to like two people that I could talk to. Wow. And so it was, um, it was really, really hard. It really was. It was very traumatic to experience and it was the best thing that I could have asked for. Ultimately looking back now, it was, I, I would never have become the person that I am today without that experience. And I'm so grateful that it happened. And I'm so grateful that the people that weren't meant to be in my life fell away and weren't part of my life. And that's what happens when you start open up and speaking your truth. Naturally, the people that are not supposed to be there, they just leave. I mean, you don't attract them anymore. What do you learn about environment? I'm just like always, you know, there are many studies that environment influences you, that you can influence your environment. I mean, you were in an environment that was very toxic. And yeah. you took actions to move, to align more with who you are and be free of that. Yeah. What were your key lessons around environment? And even now that you're applying your life? Yeah. So it was, we, we knew, uh, my, my then husband and I knew that environment was playing a huge role yeah. for me because we could see the work that I would do throughout the week with my therapist, with my group therapy, with making these breakthroughs. And then I would be around my family and I would close back up again. So the vulnerability that I was experiencing and the freedom that I was experiencing in my life was in direct conflict with the environment that I was trying to grow in. So it was like, if you're a baby plant and you're trying to push through the soil and someone keeps dropping poison all around you, it's like, oh my God, okay, we got to go back in, go back to the seed, you know, strengthen up again, because we're not quite strong enough to push through this soil. Well, maybe it's just the wrong soil. Yeah. Maybe it's the wrong food for you. Yeah. So So yeah. Yeah. I love it. And doing your work with your, with your therapist, what, what, what was the point where you were like, okay, I need to speak my truth. Not one more day. What was the breaking point for you? A second person came to me and told me that one of my sisters was being sexually abused. Wow. Right. We do for others sometimes much more than what we're willing to do for ourselves. That's amazing. Yeah. And I, I knew, I knew that I should do it for myself, Yeah, but it was, it was for someone else that I made, that I actually took the action that actually motivated, motivated me. And it was really interesting because my therapist had already been saying like, you know, I think you've, you've grown so much in the time that we've been together. I really think you need to find a different therapist to help you continue to grow. She's like, I don't know how much more I can help you. And I told her, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to have this conversation with my family. And she's like, I, she's like, I've already said that like, I'm like, you're, you've already surpassed it. She's like, I can't really help you with (laughs) with that. She's like, I'm not prepared to help you with that. And I can help you find another therapist, but it was really, it was really fascinating because, you know, I, I understand now why she was saying that it wasn't some, it wasn't a place where she, maybe she had some stuff that she was dealing with too from, from her own life, but she could, she actually, as even as a therapist couldn't be there for me for that. And so it was a very lonely road, but it was so important. It doesn't matter how lonely it gets. If you're on the right path, if you're surround, if you're choosing that new environment, that right environment, the right food, the right soil. It doesn't matter who's there, who's not there. You just take the action and you know, it's going to work out. I love that. And if you know, Stephanie, she's someone that she's always willing to go to a next level. So I'm not surprised (laughs) that you were like, I'm already there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I love what you said around it always gets worse before it gets better. So important. And we forget so many times, even in our daily lives, that 
it takes effort in order to get to that desired outcome. And sometimes you may feel like you're not getting closer. You are getting yeah. farther. What are the things that really, that you, what are the things that you learn from your experience that you actually apply in your daily life to get you through the next day, to get you to that next milestone, even when it seems hard and challenging? Well, I think by choosing to do something, even if it is really difficult, once you do that one thing, it's really easy to do other things. Yes, totally. I mean, it's, it's kind of similar to if you've ever run a marathon or something like that, you do one thing and then it's like, okay, well I did that. I can do this too. Yeah. And there's this level of knowingness about yourself. You get a lot of respect for yourself when you, when you go through with something that's challenging and the only thing that would hold you back from doing it is because it was challenging. Totally. So for me, that's a hundred percent. What I took from it was, you know, first God or the universe or source or whoever, you know, whatever you see that as always has your back. Yeah. When you take that leap of faith and I can explain more about that, how that showed up for me, but just making those decisions creates so much, um, rapport with who you are at an unconscious level and choosing to trust yourself, choosing to honor yourself, choosing to honor your truth. I mean, I had people, my next door neighbor ended up becoming a really, really close friend. And she was a therapist. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is she was like, the universe. Yeah, it was. It was. And, and she still laughs about that. She's like, that was the only she only lived in Vegas for like three months. And she's like, that is 100 percent. The only reason why I was supposed to be in Vegas was to meet you yeah. and to help yeah. you. And that's um, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was cool. So that's what I took from it, though, was that, you know, even on our worst days, we make it through. There's never we been a day where we haven't been able to make it through. Yeah, that's true. I always tell to myself in, in those days, one more day, one more yeah. day, and one more day passes and it gets better. And I feel better. I feel more hopeful. And I, there are always three questions that I ask myself in those moments that are so hard because I truly believe that the most aligned decisions are the hardest ones many times, right? And I always ask myself, am I doing this out of external validation to please people or out of internal fulfillment? Because Mm -hmm. it's my own truth. And me going through transitioning voluntarily from my corporate job to entrepreneurship was one of those instances that I started to ask those questions. And the second is, am I doing this because out of love or out of fear? you know, out of fear of like not having a steady paycheck out of fear. No, because I I had a bigger aspiration. I wanted to move towards something versus moving Mm -hmm. away from something, which is the same thing you had. And the last one, I do this future pacing. Like what is the consequence of my decision 10 minutes from now, 10 months from now, 10 years from now? Because mm-hmm. sometimes we are so zooming into that situation yeah. that we don't see the bigger vision, which is part of the keeping faith on the universe. Like you very well said it. So I, well, I, and, and at some level, when you get that gut hit that, you yes. know what you're supposed to do, it's actually worse to go against it. Oh it's more painful God. to go yes. against it than to just run with it. Cause you're like, okay, how do you, you have to surrender? You have to surrender. And honestly, that's something I'm working on. Okay. Mm-hmm. It is st- sometimes <laughs> <laughs> we are all working on, we are in the same platform, right? Yeah. Like, like we say, but how do you keep that faith in your trust? Even when at times it doesn't make logical sense. How, how, how is that for you? Mm, I, I just decided at some point in my life that this is, this is the Stephanie life. I'm the one that has to live with it. Heck yes. So I'm going to make decisions that are based on, is that the way that I want to live? Mm, that's powerful. Um, I was listening to one of the coaches we know, Tree Thorpe, and she was giving mm-hmm. this like question that she learned from a psychologist. And she was like, this is how I make decisions. Does it feel yum or yuck? 
just like a child, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I, I think that's so simple, but it's so powerful too, because we tend mm -hmm. to overanalyze and overcomplicate anything. And the mm -hmm. moment we start overanalyzing and justifying why we are making the decision, that's the moment that we get in our head and we are dead, right? In a, yep. in not a, a little sense of I like course. that yum or yuck. I like Is it, it yum or yuck? And then you decide. It's so simple, but it's so hard to go with our gut at first. Yeah. In, in my experience, and maybe this is just who I am as a person, being an indecision is the worst possible <laughs> experience to have. I would rather make the wrong decision Hell and yes. make a decision That's than right. to be stuck in indecision because it sucks. That's powerful. I feel sometimes people have this idea of right or wrong, but there is no right or wrong. Like no. it's because through schooling, through education, we have been programmed to believe that there is always a right choice, but that doesn't apply to life at all. And I always say, Hey, is it right? Or you learn, like there is no, there is no wrong anything. There is always a lesson in those moments where we face challenges and obstacles as you did, Stephanie. I mean, you didn't decide even to be there, but you mm -hmm. needed to go through that in order to get the lessons you had. You know, it's it's really about having an aim. Yes. And finding a way to get there. I When we were in Hawaii together, yeah, we were, I, I sat um, up at the Pico area where there's the coffee. Yeah. So for those listening, it's this area that overlooks the ocean. So it's a kind of a platform almost, and it looks down on there's the pools. And then below that are the beaches and the ocean. And there was a little one and a half year old who was there and he really wanted to go to the ocean <laughs> and he would just look at it. He would stare out cause it's all glass. And he had figured out that you had to walk over and take the elevator all the way down to the bottom floor. So he would keep grabbing our hands and trying to bring us. So he finally got someone who would do it. So he grabbed <laughs> their hand, walked over. He knew he'd figured out in his mind, the first step is to get someone to get them onto the elevator and to press the bottom button. He knew that. So he got down there and then they said, then he didn't know where to go. And, and the funny thing that came to my mind was it didn't actually matter because either way that he went, he would have found the beach. Oh my God. I and I was like, oh people. my God, this is such a great <laughs> metaphor for life. It is so true. Is remaining flexible, not being attached to the how, because you're going to get there somehow. Yep. Asking for help. <laughs> That is so cool. Yeah. Kids are so flexible with their communication, something that we can always learn more of <laughs> in yep. order to get there. So you, well, so you left, right, with your husband. Both of you decided to leave. You were kicked out and you were like, thankfully, this is the aligned path. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? So you were homeschooled. Did you study? Like what happened? What was happening with your career situation? How did that unfold? Yeah. So I, I didn't have a career. I was a stay at home mom for a lot of years. I'm trying to think nine years. Yeah. So Which during that the time, biggest careers ever. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, you know, I put my kids in public school <gasps> and which, you know, in my group was, was a huge no, no. Really? And, oh. um, that was, that was a, the same year that I ended up breaking, um, communication ties with, uh, both sides of, of the family. And then after that happened, I decided to, just feel into where I wanted to live. Where did I like, because everything was different. And so yeah. I was like, okay, if I'm creating this new life, like, where do I want to create it? Because I don't have to think about other things now. I just get to decide where, like wherever. And so I looked in a lot of places and I decided on, I decided on Southern California. I had not been back to Southern California since I was three <laughs> years old. And for some reason, I was just like, it's Southern California. So I drove from Vegas. I started in Malibu and just drove the coastline down. And every place I was like, no, nope, don't like it. I didn't care about the price. I didn't care about anything. I was just like, nope, 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 nope. And I hit this one beach, this one view going into Laguna Beach. And I was like, this is it. I'm home. You just and I moved in. the next month. Crazy. And, um, 
my husband at the time was like, how are we going to afford this? He's like, I still have a job in Vegas. <laughs> oh my! And I was God. like, we'll wow. figure it out. I had, I think because for me, I had already accomplished the hardest thing that I could ever possibly imagine accomplishing. I knew that I could do anything. So I was like, I'll figure it out. So I got a place. I ended up, I knew that I could take care of kids, even though I didn't have like a higher education or I'd never really pursued a career. I was like, I could be a nanny and make pretty good money. Yeah, so I ended up nannying for a couple of years while I kind of, you know, got, got settled here in Southern California, which is where I still am. And, uh, just, you know, I think, I think the, the ocean was calling me. I, I spent so much time at the ocean that first year, just healing. I needed a lot of, a, a lot of just nurturing and healing that I, I hadn't experienced my whole childhood, but also with that traumatic break, I needed, I just needed that space and, and something to, you know, fulfill my heart. And so I did that for a couple of years. And then I decided to become a real estate agent because if you live in one of the most expensive places in the world, why not make money off of it That's being right. one of the most expensive places in the world? <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> so I began a career. I, I became actually really successful in it, uh, multiple six figures. And Amazing. that's when I um, started getting into where I met you into, into personal development. Yes. What drove you to get into personal development again, because you were in therapy before and all, all that. I was still really unhappy internally. I felt like I had recreated the perfect picket fence you know, the dog, the two kids, the perfect family, it all looked so good on the outside. And I was so unfulfilled. Wow. And I, it, it was because my inner thoughts plagued me. Yeah. It was, I, I don't know how to explain it other than that. It was like a plague. It was so destructive inside of me. And so I started with, um, I mean, I, I started with going to a real estate thing where they were talking about, they were actually, now I know they were using NLP, Yeah, <laughs> but program, they were yeah. doing this, like seeing where you've come from the past five years and projecting out into the next five years, like, who do you want to be? And I was in such intense shock when I realized who I just the amount of growth and difference that had transpired within five years. I was like, Oh my God, I could be anything, anyone <laughs> do anything that I want. If I was able to accomplish that in five years, I can do whatever I want. And so I kind of thrust myself into this, um, self-development idea and started going to other courses that friends would tell me about. So it was just all based on, you know, being referred by a friend so I tried, you know, I tried one company and went through a lot of their um, programs. And what I found was that they were really helpful in me seeing where I needed to work in my life. Yeah. But didn't give me any tools. How? How do I do it? To do I work it? on that area of my life. So I was like, okay. It was like seeing, it was like, you didn't realize that you were carrying a backpack full of <laughs> crap. And so in, in that, it was like, look, you're holding a backpack is like, oh, oh, wow. Right. Oh yeah, I am. You're right. It just, <laughs> I'm appeared. aware of it. Yeah. I'm aware of it now. And they're like, open it up and see all the crap in there. And so I'd, you know, open it up and oh my God. And it's like, and now you can't put it down. <laughs> exactly. Now is there activated and what do I do with it? <laughs> so, um, and then that was when. I had gone through three prog three programs with that company. And that's when I found the um, NLP company that you and I have both studied with. And I was so amazed because it was the first experience where it was like more gentle and like, okay, here's your stuff. And guess what? We're going to teach you a couple things to help you get through it. Like to help you process, to help you set that aside and like, become more empowered. And just within four days, I had such a shift that I was like, Oh my God, this is it. <laughs> I have to go to their master level 
of neuro-linguistic programming. And it's not to work with other people. It's for me because I, in, in all the years I had found a different therapist. I'd worked with a different therapist for years. I'd tried a lot of different things along with the personal growth and development. And I just, what I, I don't even know if I could have articulated it at the time, but what I wanted was to find happiness, to find peace inside of myself and really to not experience any of the PTSD that you were um, having. Yeah. Symptoms that I was having on a, a daily basis. And so, um, that whole next year where, when I met you was this huge, like, I, I mean, I started right after I did the, the, the practitioner level, I started eating differently. I started working out every day. I, um, let go of a lot of things that weren't helping me. I made decisions to divorce my husband, um, all these things that, cause wow. I just knew that I think the energy of when you decide that something's going to help you, the energy of it begins before you even get the training. Yeah. You just trust, right? you know, yeah. that you, the universe or God has your back. You just yeah. got to move so, forward. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like, okay, we're doing this. I, it felt so much like that you know, 2013 year for me, when like I broke up with my family, it was like, <laughs> okay, we're going big or going home. You know, it's, it's that's like, how you do it, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, it was, there were a lot of challenges that year yeah. with all the decisions that I made. And I'm not going to say that it was always easy and, you know, butterflies and rainbows. And I chose to be me in a totally new way that year to oh, show up as I me, to show up as the life that I wanted to live. And that was back in 2019. And I know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're on with the tools that we learn in neuro linguistic programming. So those that don't know what NLP is, just imagine that your mind is like a computer or a phone app, like an application. And NLP is basically the code of that application to reprogram your mind to achieve the desired outcome, right? So in this case, you were experiencing PTSD and anxiety. And with the tools we learned, you were able to completely release all of that, right? Right. When I met Crazy. you, that week that I met you, I did a PTSD release. Yeah. And in 15 minutes, it released all of the PTSD that I had. Wow. And I have been able to sleep through the night every night since then. And I had never been able to sleep through the night in 20 years leading that up to that more than 20 years. So empowering. It, and it took away my work. panic. It yeah. took away the anxiety. It took away the thoughts that were so intrusive. It totally shifted some of the traumatic experiences that I had into empowering experiences because I got to kind of rewrite it to see how I wanted to experience it, even though it wasn't something that I would wish on someone else, it, it still allowed me to see how I got out of those situations. And so in that way, it was empowering for me. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was so funny. I, I remember the very first day and they, whoever was on stage said, who's here to work with other people and 99 out of a hundred people raised their hand and they're like, who's here to work on themselves. And I was like, me, I was like, both <laughs> hands ready. up. Like, I don't care about <laughs> other people. Right. I, at that point yeah. I was like, I'm not a coach. I don't care about working with other people. Like I have so much st stuff to handle within myself. I need, I need, I need all the help. <laughs> yeah. And it makes sense. Even a coach, yeah. right? Even when you don't have the clients, even like a coach is not relying on having clients. We are coaching ourselves all the time. Yeah. That's the most important work. <laughs> and what was crazy is that after that, I had so many, anybody who looked at me, any of my friends who looked at me, they'd go, what did you just do? You're oh different. God. Just testimonial. looking at, just <laughs> looking at me, it was like, you're different. What happened? And, um, I had so many people, I had never been a coach before and yeah, had so many that. people requesting to work with me so that weird. that's what kind of started me into, I started doing it on the side yeah. and then eventually it's become my, my career because I job. realized yeah, like all, all, you know, I spent 
and I, and I won't discount the work that I did with the people that I worked with for the 10 years leading up to when we met. And I will say that I spent 10 years of my life and so much money to achieve a fraction of what I achieved in such a short amount of time by, by having these tools and you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't end. There's always, there's more tools. And for me, it was such an amazing experience to realize that there was life beyond PTSD, uh -huh. that there was life beyond that experience. So beautiful. And I mean, oh my God, you have overcome so much. This is one of the most inspiring interviews I've had. So <laughs> I really appreciate you being here because- of I mean, if you overcame all of that, right, people and you can do anything. And we bring yeah. these stories into the podcast really to make all of us realize that we are creating our reality all the time and that anything is possible if we put our heart and mind into it. What other tools? I mean, something that I'm really curious about is plant medicine. And I know yeah. Eric, your fiance. They got engaged recently. Mm -hmm. It was this year, right? A few months. Yeah. Ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, April. Congrats. Congrats on that. And you guys are putting together like a retreat. Like, tell me more about it. Tell me more. About yeah. It. So when I, um, I actually met my fiance when I met Jeanette. Yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he was going through a similar experience of like creating lifestyle tools. Yeah. Right. It's like, okay, what an everyday life, what do you use to create the life that you want to live? And so we've done that together. We have, um, explored different modalities with healing arts and energy work and something that Eric had done at the beginning of his personal growth and development is that he had gone out to Peru to a center and done plant medicine. And it's a holistic healing center where they, they don't just do one particular kind of plant medicine. They do a variety and it's all to help you integrate and to have a spiritual awakening. And so he had told me about his experience and I, I just wasn't really interested in plant medicine. It didn't, it wasn't, you know, it just didn't strike a chord with me. So a few years ago though, this is a uh, year almost two years. We're coming up on two years. I woke up in the middle of the night because in a dream, I heard this voice say, you're supposed to go to Peru. You need to go to Peru and work with the plants. Oh, and I love. sat up, it was 3 AM and I sat up in bed and I was like, I'm supposed to go to Peru. And I reached out to, uh, the place where he had gone and the next day and booked my flight. I mean, that day I was like, I know what a call sounds like. I'm going to respond to whatever this is. I have never, I, at that point, I was such a virgin when it came to plant, plant medicine. medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I had, I'd experienced, um, pot like twice yeah, and I didn't yeah, yeah. like it. Like it was not my thing and I'd never done anything else yeah, at all. I mean, uh, some people have had, you know, their college years, they've, they've done different things. I didn't, I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> and there's so much to share about my experience. I went for three weeks. There's so much to share about it. But the biggest thing was when I got there, the first day I ended up doing, um, being in a ayahuasca ceremony and, every time that you're in an ayahuasca ceremony, when you work with ayahuasca, it's different. There's no, you can't say like, it's going to be this way, or it's going to be like this because every single person, every single time it's different. Even people were you with more thousands people? of times. Were you with more people or were you by yourself? I was with one other, one other person. Nice. And, uh, as a, you know, experiencer, I don't know what you call us. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, one person was holding a space and there was a shaman. And so it was the most beautiful experience that I have ever had in my life. I saw just the connection that we have to people. I saw 
the other side where we come from, I saw all these beautiful, you know, it's, it's psychedelic. So you're, you're seeing visions. And so I could see every particle in the air was a different color. And, um, it just was like this heart opening experience of you're so connected. You're so loved. Yeah. And, um, and I had gone there for that. I was, I, you know, we go through these like ups and downs in life where we get, we get to the mountaintop, we see the clarity, like we have the clarity. We're like, yes, you know, I remember where I'm going. I, you know, and then sometimes we get down in the trenches and we're like, I can't even remember where I was headed with this Mm -hmm. path. Like, I don't know how to, like, I can't turn around. I can't move forward. I don't know what to do. And so it it was one of those, you know, moments in my life. And it was so powerful. I mean, then I went into working with some other plants that um, are not psychedelic and are actually for clarity. That's, that's one of the main reasons why they work with this particular plant. And I just had so many experiences of being able to see patterns I was running in my life. And, and we're so blind to what we do because it's an unconscious behavior. Like we don't realize that we're doing something. Yeah, we don't. Like, mm-hmm. You know, we all have ways that we say things and we don't even realize that that's how we say things. Yeah, we have blind spots all yeah. over. Yeah. And so for me it was almost like not in a psychedelic way. So this medicine, this plant was was not psychedelic. So in a non-psychedelic way, I started seeing as if it was like a movie playing out of my life. And each scene the actors and the background would shift and it would be the same scene and the same scene and the same scene, just with different players and different backdrops. And it helped me to see the things that I was doing in my life that I was totally unaware of and that I could shift, which would shift my life because it shifts, you know, when we shift, it shifts other people, it shifts other experiences. And so I had a lot of I had a lot of experiences like that, where it was just like, oh, it's just kind of coming back home to yourself, like coming back home to realization, quieting out the noise. And I think out of the three weeks I was there, I was in for 10 of the days I was in, um, I like to call it solitary because you don't, you're not communicating with people. You're on your own in your little tree house and they bring you food and drop it off and stuff. And there's something about being in nature alone without any distractions or responsibility that really helps you to have an awakening, not even just a spiritual awakening, a human awakening. It is just crazy, Stephanie. And I mean, I haven't tried ayahuasca. Cody has, and he really enjoyed Mm -hmm. the experience. And I've become more curious about it. And there are many doctors that study it. So it's not this like yeah. woo-woo thing. I mean, there is data and science that backs up all of the things that Stephanie is saying. And we were listening at this episode with Joe Rogan and Dr. Gabo Mate. Yep. I'm, I'm going to send you a link. I think you would really enjoy it. And I've, I've was- listened to half of it. I have it. D- do you yeah. like it? Yeah. Someone else sent it to me this past week. Yeah. So at the end, I think he starts talking about ayahuasca around halfway or a little bit before. Mm -hmm. And he talks also about ADHD and all of these things. And it's just really insightful, everything that he provides and the experiences he has had. And they literally are very similar to what you're describing. So again, this is not, not Stephanie and Eric. I mean, this is backed by experiences, data, science, experiments. So I mean, I'm, I'm curious. I love educating myself and I have, and I'm curious, you know, to try it in the future. So that's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. The benefits of it are incredible. They, you know, a lot of people that have anxiety, depression, or PTSD are cured after an experience with the plants. And I think the other thing that's very cool about it is that we think that it's crazy to like go sit with plants in the jungle, (laughs) but look at, look at the human experience right now. Mm -hmm. We're on, we're looking at screens and letting that rule our lives, go out to dinner, look around, see who is actually communicating. 
who is yeah. actually present. This is what's crazy. This is what's crazy. The human experience currently is never giving yourself enough time to hear your, your inner self, to never give yourself time to check in. We have all the answers within us. Yeah. So learning how to tap in, that's what the plants do. They help you learn how to tap in to your own wisdom. That is they beautiful. open you up to believe that there is actually a different reality out there. Yeah. You can, so you can cool. kind of lift back the veil and realize that, you know, there's something different. You get to create your reality. You get this understanding of what the human experience is supposed to be about. And you realize how, you, you know, how it, what is occurring right now in our world is affecting you. Yeah. We were talking about environment earlier. The environment that we set ourselves up in is not necessarily healthy all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, most so. of the time, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. How do you, so I was telling Cody this and he was like, well, maybe you need to work on that. And I'm like, okay, it, it may be true. <laughs> you know, when you're like, wow, baby, I wasn't ready for that right now. But thank you. <laughs> I am yes. like, uh, because we are projecting all the time, but sometimes we are not ready to hear that truth. And, <laughs> and I was like, baby, but I don't know. What about trusting me being with someone else doing this like plant medicine thing on me, which I don't know. And I want to bring this to light because trust is a, a big thing for all of us. And I know whoever I mean you guys are working with someone who is trustworthy and he has a lineage and tell me more about that part like how do you trust them this company or person or whatever to be there in a room with you I, I don't know that's always my concern but I'm working on trust apparently <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> I know I'm like thank you baby I think the place that we went to, I think I had a level of trust just because I had, Eric had been there. Yeah. Another of our friends had been there. And so I had a, a certain understanding. It wasn't just like I was going into a place that I had never heard of that I'd found on the internet. And, um, so there's that, but I think, you know, a lot of the trainings that you and I have done together with energy work, they talk a lot about holding space and we talk about it in the coaching world too. And when you get into a space where you can psychedelically experience what is occurring and you can see it, you understand what it means for someone to hold space for you mm -hmm. in a totally new way. It's not a concept. You actually get to experience it. And so for me, when I experienced that the first night that I was there, that changed everything for me wow. because I realized that um, it, it wasn't something that I had to cognitively work myself through. It was something that I actually experienced. And that brings up a good thing that I'd like to point out as well, because I didn't realize how important it was before yeah. I went. Yeah. And, um, that's the reason why we decided to start leading groups to Peru, because we realized that it is absolutely crucial who you have as a safe person or persons to hold space for you that know how to work with energy that, um, you know, the, the man who runs the center where we take groups to, and where we've been, he has drank thousands of times he's been given permission by the tribes to serve ayahuasca and he still won't he still defers to the people that have the direct lineage of ayahuascaros and that can speak with the plants from their family line and he will sit and hold space and he knows how to work with the plant but he defers to them and he has created this beautiful environment where you you know, you're detoxing from the food that we eat, the mm -hmm. air that yeah, we're around, yeah. you know, we're detoxing from our cell phones, from, you know, responsibility conversations about work and all of that. <laughs> Worries, anxiety, um, yeah. Providing the most amazing, incredible local organic food, um, 
That is he so. has worked with so many, he has dedicated his entire life to working with and dieting different plants to see how they work and in interaction to see how he can best support anyone that comes in because it's all individualized care. So if someone needs something very gentle, he knows how to help them with those plants a lot. There's, there's some, uh, sacred plants that work alongside with ayahuasca in particular that work really well in helping you open up to the messages that ayahuasca helps you to see. And also to gain clarity after you receive the messages, because, you know, when you have this big experience and you're opened up, what good is that? Unless you bring it into your life unless you integrate it. And so what he has dedicated his life to is honoring the traditions of the tribes, allowing us to experience it as well and how to integrate best. That's why, um, some ayahuasca centers, you know, you just go for a few days, you drink as often as you can, and then you go home here, that's not recommended because it's about transformation. It's not about an experience. It's about a transformation. It's about integrating the spiritual awakening into your life. And so even with all the work that he's done, and it's, it's very beautiful how he puts it all together and the different people that he brings in to work with each person. We also notice that there's, there's a lack for once you get back to the real world quotation marks, of integrating, even with the help of other plants, because you leave for two or three weeks and you come, you grow like as if you were in a growth seminar for 300 years. Wow, and then really? you come back and everybody, you're just coming back to, they think that you went on vacation. Really? You weren't gone that long, but, <laughs> but there's no, like time doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Time doesn't exist. That's right. And so that. you come back and sometimes we need help to not only just integrate the teachings into us, which is a lot of what happens out at the center, but then we need to integrate it into our lives. And so that's why we chose not only why it's important to go to this center that we found, but also to do integrative coaching with it so that people can bring everything that they learned that they integrated into themselves and integrate it into their lives here. I, I love that so much because one of the things that Cody was telling me is that, you know, you get a lot of insights and lessons. And one of the most important part is to implement those as you integrate back into life. So I love that you and Eric are providing this coaching component after the transformational experience in Peru. So mm-hmm. that's very well thought out. So congrats. I'm so excited. And thank you. There are many modalities, right, to get to a similar place. There is NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, Hypnosis, uh, Plant Medicine. There is, I mean, and all of this help, I think what's important is to learn what resonates with you to experiment and see what works best for you. So if plant medicine resonates with you, I mean, I couldn't recommend someone better than, you know, Stephanie and Eric. So definitely reach out to them because they are amazing coaches, amazing leaders, and they have gone through a transformation themselves, which is, they lead by example, which is really important. Stephanie, I'm so excited to have you here. And I want to conclude, start concluding with this question. So if someone feels stuck in their life, just like you were when you were in the cold, if someone feels like they don't see the way out, what would you recommend to this person in order to be more empowered and to continue finding their own light? I would recommend that they find someone to help them because I think the first step is when you're stuck, you need help. Even for us, even for people that are working in this day in and day out, when we get stuck, we need some, we forget that the, we have the tools that we have. Mm -hmm. And so I think in my opinion, it's always reaching out. It's always reaching out to someone who can actually help, not someone, not a friend where you can just bitch about what's going on, but where you can reach out and actually get help from someone. So like coaching with Jeanette is an amazing way to help you get unstuck. If you have 
a lot that you need to get through and you're willing to deep dive. I mean, come with us to the jungle <laughs> the Amazon, and then, cool. and, and then coach with Jeanette. <laughs> yeah. Or Hey, with Stephanie and Eric, whoever resonates with you and just, exp- I truly believe, I mean, one of the things we were saying that we learned from one of the teachings that we learned from is that not all, not all knowledge is in the same school. So we yeah. all believe in experimenting and learning what resonates because there are so many paths to the same destination, right? So part of this life is to understand what that looks like for you. And Absolutely. That's why I love your journey. And I am so happy. I know you're super busy. So I'm so happy that you dedicated one hour of your time to spend with us and share your story and share your magic and your knowledge. Um, as I mentioned before, this has been one of the most inspiring interviews that I've done. I appreciate you. I respect you as a person, oh, as a you. coach. And right back at you. <laughs> I know the legacy you and Eric both are leaving is going to impact many people, my friends. So Thank you so much. And how can the audience find you? How can the audience find you, Eric? Tell us all about it. Well, you can find me on social media. I'm Steph Garvey. Or really, if you're interested in going to the jungle, you can find us on Light in the Jungle. There's a website, there's social media. So either of those places. I love it. Anything else, my friend, as we conclude, anything else you want to say? Thank you so much for having me. I am so grateful. One of the things that I did not expect on my journey was to find people that are empowered like you to be good friends with. And I'm so honored to be able to share this lifetime with you. Oh, thank you so much. Me too. I am so honored to spend this lifetime with you. Thank you so much to all of our listeners. I hope today's story was super empowering, inspiring, and aspirational. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Steph. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening at With Clarity and Purpose. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Sharing is caring. Please share with your friends and family so we can continue building an empowered community together. I'll see you next week.